do this. Hi, Miriam. Oh, <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, my name's Maris Kreisman and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming up soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversations for your question, so start thinking about them now. You can put all of your questions into the Zoom chat at any time, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the event, I'll post links in the chat to buy Jill's latest book, Everything After, from McNally Jackson. And that leads me to introduce the author of the hour, Jill Santopolo, who is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author of The Light We Lost and More Than Words. Her work has been translated into more than 35 languages. She is also the author of three successful children's and young adult series and works as the associate publisher of Philomel Books. A New Yorker at heart, Jill is currently living in Washington, DC. And joining her tonight is Donna Freitas, the author of The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano, which is coming out very soon. And I will post a link um, in the chat to pre-order that one too. It's her first adult novel. She's the author of Consent, a memoir of unwanted attention, as well as 10 novels for children and young adults. Donna has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Boston Globe. She has been a professor at Boston University and Hofstra University, and is currently a member of the faculty at Fairleigh Dickinson University's MFA program. Donna and Jill, it's so nice to have you here, and uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting us to chat tonight. Hi, everybody. So Jill, are you going to start with a little bit of a reading? Oh, yes. OK. Um, this is just a very short reading because we're on Zoom. And I feel like a long reading on Zoom might not be the best forum. So very, very short. Um, this is, I guess, I, well, I'm going to show you because so the, this book there is there's Roman numeral chapters and regular cha number chapters. So this is Roman numeral one. Maybe this will help. Maybe I won't think about you anymore. Dream about you. Maybe I won't have to keep wondering, always wondering, were you even real? Now we're at regular number one. As she walked down Astor Place toward her office, Emily Gold rested her hand on her abdomen, trying to figure out if it felt different if there was something new in there, a constellation of cells that would grow as she did, would end up as a tiny person with deep brown eyes like Ezra or wavy auburn hair like her. Emily hadn't known she wanted a baby until she met Ezra. Then the idea of creating a child with him, of having another person living in this world who had his intelligence, his compassion running through their veins. It seemed like something she would have to do, the way she had to breathe, to blink, to swallow. And once she wanted it, once she knew it had to happen, she became immediately afraid that it wouldn't, that she couldn't. The fact that they put it off for a couple of years didn't help. Ezra had wanted to get a promotion first, a raise, an apartment, to make sure they'd be able to give this child everything they possibly could. Now the time was right. They'd been trying for seven months, months of hope and anticipation and disappointment. And now she was late, only by a day, but still, every hour made it feel more real, more possible. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for that very short but wonderful telling reading about your book. And uh, I thought it would be great if we could just start off uh, by you telling us a little bit more about your book. Like, what is your book book about? Like, in your own words. Um, um, so my book is about Emily Gold who is mostly happily married, living in New York City. And she and her husband are 
trying to start a family. Um, but then a tragedy that happens in her current life echoes a tragedy that happened in her past. And it kind of turns her entire world upside down when secrets she'd been keeping even from her husband come to light and sort of change their relationship. And then at the same time, she hears a song on the radio and realizes it's her college boyfriend writing about her 15 years later. And she has to decide what she wants her life to look like and if the path she's been on is the one she wants to stay on or if she wants to change directions. So I feel like that's such a theme in all of your novels, but in particular, like the first thing I wanted to ask you about was the topic of lost love. Cause I feel like that's, that runs, well, it's certainly in the light we lost, um, but it's such a huge theme in this book too. And I just feel like love in general is a theme in your book, but so it seems like Emily has two or maybe three lost loves, depending on how you want to look at it. I want to give everything away, but she's got at least two of them are Rob, but then also music. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things I wanted to know is, well, I wanted to know about lost love in, in, your, in your books, but also why did you pick music as the lost love for Emily? So I think lost loves in general you know, I guess in thinking about life, I feel like we love so many people and so many things through the course of our lives. And a lot of them aren't there for the entirety of your life. You know, whether it's a friend or a romantic partner or a parent or, you know, a, a passion for music or art or dance or model trains. Like there are just so many things that you can love and then they don't become, they're, they're not in your life anymore. And the reason that music is in this book is when I was younger, when I was a kid, I took piano lessons and flute lessons and I played in my school's band from third grade to 12th grade. And I sang in our vocal ensembles and music was a huge part of my life as a kid. I wasn't good. I'm not good but I loved it. And as I was sort of, you know, growing up, getting older, the things that you're perhaps not going to pursue as a career kind of fall away a little bit. I felt the same way about gymnastics, which I was also not great at, but I loved. And like, as an adult, I took a gymnastics class because I was like, oh my gosh, I used to love this. I'm going to do this again. And you know, it just makes me think there are so many things that I love to do that I just don't do anymore. And, you know, music was a big one because it took up so much of my life when I was a kid. Um, so that's kind of why I decided to put that in there. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking about who we are when we're in high school or college and the passions we have, and then the directions we choose to take and you know the paths we could have taken and and what that would look like i have one more question about the music did you when you were writing this book did you actually try to sing the song like did you make up the whole song did you make up all the music stuff how did you do that so this is super fun so i was writing the lyrics to the songs and in my head there was like a tune because you know i don't know you're writing a song there's a tune and I was talking to my friend, Jessica Ann Karp, who's actually, I see her face right there with her son, Jedediah. Hello guys. Um, who is a friend from high school who is an absolutely phenomenal musician. So I was talking to her about this book and um, I asked her to you know, read it for, for sort of authenticity. And she said to me, well, you know, if you have the melody for these songs, I could write them for you. And I was like, no way, really? And she's like, yeah, wait, yeah, wait, really? So, um, so she did it. And so I sang, I sent her um, voice notes of two of the songs, uh, Crystal Castle and Everyone But Me. And she took my voice notes and turned it into guitar accompaniment for Crystal Castle and um, piano accompaniment for Everyone But Me. And if people go to my website and subscribe to my newsletter on March 20th-ish, 
it's going to come out and you will get links to both of those songs. Um, one that Jessica performs and one that a musician named Sam Rovin performs. Wow, I was going to ask you that if there was going to be like a musical companion to the book. I don't suppose you want to sing any of it for us live. No, um, no though I do sing on the audiobook, but it's it was um, uh, but I, you know, I don't know if I can do it. I tried the other night and I think I might. Let me see if I can do this. I had figured out, I think, how to share audio. And if I can share audio, I will, I will try and share that book. I will try and figure out, but you don't have to watch me figure it out. Let's see. In the meantime, you could hum for us. Yeah. Um, I think it's, if I do, this and then this okay and then I go to oh wait do I have the ability to share my screen yes no I don't I can't share my screen I'm not the host sorry <laughs> have to you do. now you do now you Jill oh now I do Okay, so now I do share sound and I sh share. Let's see if we can make it happen. The world. I built you a castle in my dreams with towers, with turrets, with everything always how it seems. I thought my love for you would die, would wither, would fade, but it beats strong inside me still. So I built you that castle on a hill, a crystal castle on a hill. So there you go. That was that was Sam Rovin singing. And if you subscribe to my newsletter, you'll get to hear Jessica. That was awesome. Thank you for <laughs> sharing that with us. It's the, the world debut. Yes. That we got to hear. You got to hear it first. That's really cool that you um that you actually like wrote the music and then or you know, like wrote the song and then made the music happen. And I learn new things about you all the time, Jill. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you said to me once a million years ago uh, when we were talking about writing was that you feel like we come back to the same themes over and over again and you would ask me what my theme was and so um, I'm wondering like now especially now that you've shifted to adult books um, like, what do you think your theme is? Like, what is the thing that you keep working out when you're, when you're writing? Oh, man. Um, I feel like, I feel like it actually goes back to your first question of loss and, and losing things you love. I think that's kind of what the light we lost and more than words and everything after really are about in essence and how to cope with the loss of something or someone you love. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a line in Everything After where uh, Emily, the main character says that she has always looked back on her life and seen what she's lost. And now she's starting to look back and see what she's loved. And I feel like shifting Shifting the focus from loss to love, I think, is what I'm trying to work through as I write. What 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 was your answer to me? Now I can't believe I don't remember it. Um, it was a long time ago. It may I think about it all the time though, because I feel like it was one of these formative questions that someone asked me that has stayed with me. But I think I um, I'm always writing about sort of the same things in some ways, like starting over. Like, I feel like a lot of my characters 
have something happen so that everything that they thought was the way things were is suddenly different. And then they have to cope with that or they have to move forward after something drastic has changed in their life. And so I feel like I keep coming back to that theme too. So. And you got to do that a lot in the nine lives of Rose and Paula. Yeah. <laughs> so it comes up a lot. So. Yeah. <laughs> but like the, that, that one, the drastic thing is like, you know, she, she has to cope with a change in her life um, that she didn't really want to deal with. <laughs> so, and then she has to keep moving forward from it. But I think that's the theme. I wondered if you were gonna say, so I was debating actually, I was debating what your answer would be to that question. Okay. And if it was going to just be love, just like love is the theme you just keep coming back to, like falling in love, finding love after, you know, misplacing it sort of, or, um, <laughs> And I feel like it's such a theme in, in this book too. Everything after is, is so much about that. But I also wondered if it was loss, if it was just like, like grieving in some ways, grieving what, what could have been, you know, those passions that you maybe leave behind and you go, don't get to have as life moves on. So that was my other. Yeah, my other. I, think, I think love too, though you're right. Cause I, I was just thinking it's, there's lots of different kinds of love throughout my three books, you know, love of, of partners, of children, of parents, of siblings, of friends, of music, of photography, of art. Well, so speaking of children, which is my next question, oh. and I know there's a small one downstairs in your house, but there are also, children is a big topic in your book. And so I'm wondering, you know, it feels like a new topic for your books. Um, having children, wanting children, et cetera. And so I'm wondering, you know, like the ones that arrive when we're not ready, the ones that don't arrive when we are ready. <laughs> and so like what what provoked this uh, shift in in the topic for your for your new book? You know, I think I, I was reading actually today, so this didn't provoke the topic but I thought it was really interesting. Um, Lori Gottlieb, who wrote Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, who, which is a, a book that I just really loved. Um, she was talking today in one of her columns about the idea, I think it's called, oh man, I forgot the word. It's some kind of grief. And it's this, it's this kind of grief that I'd never heard about, but it's, um, she said, it's there when you are mourning the loss of something you've never had. And she said that a lot of people, for example, in her practice who don't have a partner and want one experience this kind of grief that's like um, an uncertain, uncertainty about the future, kind of not, you know, going back and forth between excitement and about the possibilities and then sorrow about things not working out. And that she said the other place that people experience the same kind of grief is when they're trying to have a child but are not getting pregnant. And it's the same kind of a feeling of this uncertainty about the future and the, um, the hope and then the disappointment in cycles. And I um, I was I was reading that and I was thinking about it and I think it actually really very much relates to why I started writing everything after, um, you know I started writing it right around when my husband and I got engaged and and um, we're getting married, and then I wrote a lot of it and worked on it a lot while we were wanting to have a child and trying to have a child and not getting pregnant with a child and. And I actually ended up finding out I was pregnant the week that I handed in the final revisions for this book. So a lot of what came into it was that struggle. And I think that, um, I think that each book that I write comes from some place deep in my heart in, of what's going on at that moment in time. And you know, The Light We Lost came after a horrible breakup. More Than Words came after my father died. And this book sort of came after that struggle to have a child. And um, you know, there's a, a professor at Vermont College of Fine Arts where I, I got my MFA, 
who always says to write like your heart is on fire. And I feel like that's, that's something that I really took to heart and I try and put my heart on the page and in all of my books. And so whatever is affecting my heart at that moment is what comes out in the book. So, well, I mean, I think there's so much longing. There's so much longing in all your books. There's a lot of longing that could just be <laughs> like Jill writes longing, um, longing by Jill Santopolo. Um, but I think there's so much longing around this, this topic in the book. And so, you know, it's interesting that, you know, you are experiencing this, this struggle and this yearning, like as you're writing it and, and, you know, now it's resolved in your life. <laughs> So like, do you think that um, the topic of children will sort of still set your heart on fire, like, or wanting children, or do you, are you imagining it's going to shift as you move forward with your books? I mean, I imagine I probably won't write another book about longing for a child, but I, I do imagine that there will be other books that involve relationships with children, because mm -hmm. I think that's something that will be in my heart, you know, as I move forward. Um, I wanted to ask about the fact that your writing life has changed so dramatically in the, the last few years. Uh, when we were, when we were, you know, when we first met, we were both writing children's books. And you know, now you're, you're writing all these wonderful books for adults. And I guess I was wondering, you know, what's your favorite part about this shift and, and sort of a two part question. So like, what's your favorite part about the, about the shift, but also, um, has it, has it allowed you to write into these themes in ways you didn't like expect you were going to when you're writing kids books? Like how has it affected your life in that way? Yeah. I mean, so, so when I, I loved writing kids books. When I was writing kids books, I never thought I was going to not write kids books. Um, but then the light we lost happened. And, you know, what my, what I, what is really fun about children's books, I think, is that you get to inhabit a 10 year old or a 12 year old or an eight year old. And you get to write about life from that perspective when things feel very different than they do when you're, you know, almost 40. But what I think is a real gift in writing for adults, at least for me, is that I get to write about life from the adult perspective. And there's a lot more that I can explore and talk about and a lot more layers to life that I can put in the books. And I think that that's a lot of fun and really rewarding for me. Um, and one of the things I loved about writing children's books was going into schools and visiting kids and writing stories with them. So I haven't really been doing that, um, but I've had the gift of getting to go to people's book clubs, women's book clubs, and getting to talk to them about my book and their lives and how they relate to my stories. And I've always thought of stories as kind of connectors between people, among people. Um, and it's really been beautiful for me to see how reading my book has connected them not only with the characters in the story, but also with each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was one book club I went to where the women had met sort of slightly later in their lives and they were reading The Light We Lost. And they all started talking about the people that they dated before they were with their husbands or wives. Mm -hmm. And they learned about each other's lives more in that book club than they had in like, you know, five, 10 years of friendship. So I thought that was really, really cool. I always feel like the best part of having written is the connections you get to, to like the conversations you get to be a part of. And it's funny that you mentioned connection. I just had a conversation the other day with an academic friend. I was helping him with a book proposal. And I was, I was like, listen, I was like, you have to stop trying to prove something to people because like academics are it's all about proving something i was like you're not writing to prove you're writing to connect with your reader and i said that and i was like oh yeah i mean that <laughs> like i think that's true like, I write that up and hang that on my wall <laughs> um i have so just like i i just want to mention to the people who are who are here in the small boxes that 
if you want to um, ask your questions to please you know type them into the chat and i'll be um i'll be picking the most exciting ones to ask jill or just whatever ones that come up they don't have to be exciting <laughs> so but just to like throw that out there um but one of the things that i am wondering jill is like so so you have readers now or you, you like just have a few you know now your book's been out for like a week right so your readership will expand and expand exponentially and what are you hoping that like most of all that readers get from reading everything after as opposed to like maybe some of your other books like what what do you hope their heart feels after they walk away from it so part of the reason i wrote this book um and put the main character having a miscarriage in the book is that a few years ago, a number of my close friends had experienced miscarriage. And when I was talking to them about it, one of the main things that kept coming up with all of the friends that I spoke to was that they felt really isolated and alone afterward because there's something about society that kind of makes you feel that you, sh this is a taboo subject. You shouldn't talk about it with people. And then you're walking around with this like silent grief and, and maybe even feeling slightly ashamed, which you shouldn't, of course, um, but sometimes happens. And I, I was thinking I would really love to write a book that if women have had that experience, they read this book and feel less alone, feel like their experience is shared by someone. Mm -hmm. And a few people who have read early copies of it have reached out to me to say, like, how did you know what I was feeling when I went through this? Or how did you know how my husband acted? And that to me is the, the, real, the real takeaway that I hope people have from this book. And also that you can talk about miscarriage, that if you're not a woman who's had one, but you read a book where it happens, it's it becomes something that you can discuss, something that can be talked about publicly. I do think it's one of those topics, like it, it's often just so invisible because especially if you, know, you haven't told people yet, uh, you know, that you're pregnant and maybe just your partner knows, or maybe just you know. And so there's a way in which you can sort of not tell anyone and not have anyone know, or just sort of erase, like try to move forward and not think about it. And so I think it is one of those things that's so invisible, like no one, it's, or it's very rare, I think that people talk about it openly, so. And it's something that you write about in your book too. Yes, I do. Um, well, I was actually thinking too, when you were talking that we've both written about topics that people don't talk about. You wrote about miscarriages. I wrote about a woman who doesn't want children. Um, and I think those are two things that we just don't have discussions about much. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think, well, especially with uh, women who don't want to have children, I feel like it's so assumed that women want children that that's kind of, you almost have to explain it before someone starts to ask you, you know? Well, you, oh, you have to explain that you don't want children. Like, like that, that's how society has sort of set it up, that it's not like, like there's this expectation. I know, I feel like I was, I was just saying earlier today on a podcast that I did that, um, like, oh, I feel like, I, I wonder if um, after COVID, uh, or because of COVID, the the generations coming up are actually going to think about having children as a question, like like whether or not to become a mother, as opposed to just a given. Um, and and then I joked about how like maybe my book will help people realize it's a question, <laughs> it's not just a given. No, I think it's true, and I think it's important. I think it's important. Um, so I, as we wait for questions. Um, I'm gonna, I want to ask you my personal juicy, well, not juicy question, but about, well, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about what I experienced when I was reading your book. 
on okay. a personal level, <laughs> which has to do with my personal life, with maybe some of you in the boxes know. But um, so uh, so my my ex husband is a musician or was a musician, and um, my greatest fear when we got divorced was that one day soon after I was going to hear a song that he wrote, like he was going to break out. He's always on the cuffs for breaking out. He was going to finally break out and get a song on the radio. It was going to be a huge hit and it was going to be about me. And I would go everywhere and I was going to hear it everywhere and it was going to be horrible. So I feel like what's interesting about this, um, what you did with, with Rob, you know, so Rob writes this wonderful song, which you, you know, played a little excerpt of for Emily. And she hears it though, and she's like bopping along to it. And she's like playing it in the house. And so um, she, she's experiencing my greatest fear with, um, with joy though. So, so I guess I'm wondering, did you, was that a fantasy of yours at any point that somebody would write you a song and you'd hear it on the radio? It wasn't, but there was this, this like rumor that was going around in like the Columbia alumni community that Delilah from the Hey There Delilah Plain White Tea song went to Columbia. I don't know if it's actually true. It was like, but it was a rumor going around and you know, it's like, Hey There, hey there Delilah, was it like in New York City? So I don't know. But ever since I heard that, I thought, I wonder what it would be like to be Delilah, like to be the woman who somebody wrote the song about and it's everywhere. And I thought, you know, at the right moment in time, that could be something really buoying, you know? And I feel like here, she hears that song, Emily hears that song when she's in a really vulnerable place and it sort of gives her back a piece of herself that she thought she lost because she sees herself as Rob saw her through the song. Um, it is so, it's so lovely in the book. When I first got to it though, I, part of me wanted to be like, Emily, run for your life. <laughs> oh, and I think no matter if my ex-husband ever wrote a song and there's no way, to, it, it, there, it couldn't be, I, I would never go back. Yeah, it couldn't be that good a song. So um, I think no, no amount of hits would send me Nothing. back there but anyway <laughs> that's another conversation so um okay so question from cheryl klein uh what are some of your favorite big choices this is such a good question cheryl klein what are some of your favorite big choices in literature example love triangles and so what do you make what do you think makes those big choices so compelling so one of my favorite love triangles in all of literature is um, King Arthur, Lancelot, and Queen Guinevere. And I think it's a super, super compelling love triangle because both men are very appealing for different reasons. And both men, especially in Persia Woolley's Queen of the Summer Stars, which I loved as a teenager um and it's like Guinevere is the main character so both of both men appeal to different parts of who Guinevere is and what she wants and I feel like that to me is what makes a really good love triangle where the different choices fulfill part of who that third person is so that each of them feel equally possible as choices that's also yes. what makes them torturous though, especially if right. they fulfill one fills one part of fulfills one part of you. This is the problem with Emily, Rob, and Ezra. And Ezra. <laughs> no. <laughs> so because she gets certain things from certain men, but not right. full. Ezra's not Ezra's not playing the piano or the drums or anything. Right. You but that so I think, yeah, I think um the, the choice that Queen Guinevere has to make about Lancelot or King Arthur is one of my favorite literary choices. But what's what's yours? Oh, I was also just a note. I went through a huge King Arthur phase and read every version of all the you know King Arthur books for like a couple of years. Um, yeah, I was like every one of them. I think 
I think mine also just has to do with like choosing. I'm really obsessed with what if I make the wrong choice, like in my own life to the point where I'm often paralyzed. <laughs> and so I think, you know, the choice of like who to love or um, that that one is, I think, probably the, the biggest one. Or just what if I make a mistake? Like, what if I what if I choose wrong and then it's the worst choice, like worst mistake of my life, which is why everybody should have nine lives. I feel like that was such a therapeutic book for me because I could keep making choices and see how they played out. And then being like, nope, that didn't work out. I'm going to try again. I feel like that would be great. We could do that. Tomorrow. I think that's actually another theme that's in a lot of my books is the idea of like, is life fated? Are our choices fated? Because one of the things that Emily's mom says over and over in this book is what happens is what's supposed to happen. That's sort of her belief. Um, so there's some comfort in that, right? Because any choice, that means that any choice you make is the choice you were supposed to make at that moment in time. But then if you choose something else later, you were supposed to make that choice too. Yes, but then what if your life is totally messed up that your life is supposed to be messed up? Supposed to be messed up. That, that is a flaw in that reasoning. <laughs> Oh, there, so, okay, um, let's see. Monica wants to know, oh, this is a good question that I bet a lot of people have. Do you think there will be a, a sequel to The Light We Love? A lot of people ask me that question. I don't know if there will be a sequel to The Light We Lost. I do know that I have some thoughts about what might happen next. Um, and there might be some way that I could put those out into the world, even if there's not a full sequel. Um, and it's fun to think about. I do think that if I wrote anything else about the three of those people, it would actually be from Darren's point of view, because I think that the most difficult part of Lucy's life has, has happened, but the most difficult part of Darren's life is still to come. I love that. What, I was just going to follow up with a question asking you, like, is there a side character? Like, I always think it's really interesting when authors take a, like a minor character or not the central character and then write a story from their perspective. So you're still in the same world, but you're, you're not in that same story. So that was one of the things I was gonna ask. I don't know if you've thought about that for your other books too. Well, all of my books actually take place in the same world. So there are characters from almost all of them in the other ones. So if you read everything after, there are characters from More Than Words and The Light We Lost who make cameos. And in more than words, there's a cameo from someone from the light we lost. So I, 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 I liked the idea of them all kind of occupying the same world. And I'm working on a new book now and there will be, there will be people from these other books who make appearances. Just Wait, is, this, is this the Italy one? This is the Italy one, but it's also New York. It's Italy and New York. I was going to say, do they all go to Italy? That would be lovely, but <laughs> I love that Cheryl. I was just thinking that with the Jilliverse. <laughs> <laughs> Such yeah. a Bolopolis. Cheryl also has another question that I wanted to go back to, which goes back to the music, but I, I like it. Um, what love song would you want to have written about you, Jill? Oh, man. I don't know. For some reason, Wind Beneath My Wings just popped into my head. Like, that would be lovely if that was written about me. But I don't know, maybe not. That's a great question. When you were working on the music for the book, were you thinking, were you writing it for yourself in a way? Or were you specifically writing it for your characters? No, I was specifically writing it for my characters. Yeah. You could write it for your, you could write new music for yourself and then have your friends. <laughs> yeah. perform it and then perform send it out in your, in your newsletter. Um, so, uh, wait, where does go? Oh, so Randy wants to know, says they're a big fan of your books. Like, what are you currently working on? You've sort of started talking about this before. Like, what are you writing? Like, can you say a little bit more about your, about your next book? Yeah. So, um, I'm working on a new novel that is tentatively called Jupiter and Juno. And it takes place in 1946 in Italy and 2019 in New York City. And it's about the grandparent generation and grandchild generation of two different families and sort of how they're connected. 
Um, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. I've been, I've been keeping track of my Google searches, which I always like try and do at the beginning of novels, just to kind of see what it is I'm looking up. And it's been like 1940s wedding dresses, Italian, uh, Italian monarchy, like all of these sort of different fun things. And then Rothko, he made his way in there too. Will there be a, another post, well, post COVID research trip to Italy? You know, I've been trying to go on a research trip to Italy literally since COVID started. And I have already canceled one, probably two trips by the time this is done. And we're trying to figure out when it will be safe again to go. I mean, I've been following it and my mom actually just texted me today that Italy is going back into lockdown and there's a third wave over there. So I don't know how quickly they're gonna be vaccinated. I think the US will be vaccinated first and until until there's herd immunity over there too, I think I'm not gonna be able to go, but I'm, I'm hoping before this book is in final page proofs, I'll be able to do another research trip there. I'm with you and that watching, I feel like I keep moving all of my, my trips. So maybe we'll be over there at the same time eventually. So <gasps> fingers crossed one day. I think we have time for a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, but while we're waiting to see if anyone else has questions, I have a question about um, about whether your mom has read your books, in particular this book, especially since it's about motherhood. But um, I'm asking this partly selfishly because um, for the first time ever in my life, my dad, who doesn't read um, anything, <laughs> just asked me about my new book coming out That's and so nice. I was going to send him links to events. And I was sort of like, no. And then I told him maybe, but um, how is like, what is that like for like, I don't know, does your mom read? And then what is your relationship with your mom and your books? My mom does read and um, my mom has read all my books and she's probably one of the biggest cheerleaders of my books, um, which is really, really fun. So I think, I don't know, we've never really had a super deep conversation about what she's like fully thought about the, the themes or. What about the sexy bits? She doesn't seem to mind the sexy bits. Though I do have to say one of my father's friends started listening to the audiobook <laughs> of The Light We Lost and got a couple chapters in and was like, I'm sorry, I can't do this. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think particularly because I'm reading the audiobook, it made it even worse. So is it weird to read the sex scenes out loud in the audiobook? Out loud in the audiobook. Um, it was initially weird at the first one, uh, in the, like the first couple. And then I kind of got used to it. And now in this book, it didn't bother me. I was just like, yeah, this is what happens when I read my audiobooks out loud. I've always felt like, it's really liberating that my dad doesn't read any of my books because I, it means I can write whatever I want. Um, so I do write whatever I want and <laughs> now I don't want him to read it. <laughs> I still love it though. Uh, I don't know. I mean, he probably won't read it. He might just hold the book and look at it, <laughs> but not actually open it. Um, but I think I think it would, I would be super nervous if like, you know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of sex scenes in your books. Not like you didn't know that, but I love <laughs> the way you have this wonderful mixture of, um, of sex and love and like, lo like you just have, you, I think there's a very rich world and rich relationships um, in your, in your books, but you really balance out the sex scenes with, but there's quite a few too. Well, there are, especially in The Light We Lost. That one's like very sexy and heavy. There's like six in this one. Not that I counted. You didn't get you counted. <laughs> there might be more. So, um, okay. So we have a question from Jennifer. Which of your characters that you've written about do you think has been the easiest for you to relate to? That's such a great question. That is a great question. I think parts of all of them really, because I'm sort of writing from a place of, my own emotions and that emotion gets poured into this character 
then I can relate to that piece of the character. Whereas like Nina, for example, is super fancy and super wealthy, which I am neither. Um, so that piece of her life was not something I could personally relate to, but losing her father and her grief over that and of, you know, like that, that was something that I could very much relate to. And that's why I wrote her. Um, and I think the same, you know, with Emily, there, there are pieces of her that are not like me at all, but I can relate to how she feels about, you know, wanting or deciding to or not to have a child and all of that. They're all, they're all related to you. Yeah. In some way. I really think we write the books that we need at the time. I think you're right. Um, so we'll do this one more question that came in and then I'll ask you my last question, Jill. So, um, okay, so Miriam, Miriam says, both of you focus so much on choice and specifically a woman's choice in your novels. Is there a choice in your lives that have, has brought unexpected results? Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you want to go first? I don't know. <laughs> Um, yes, marrying a man who didn't want children, who then changed his mind. <laughs> that, that, that was a big, that was that unexpected. unexpected. That resulted in many years of unexpected results. So I wouldn't advise it, <laughs> advise doing that in your life. <laughs> so. Yeah, I feel like the question that, like the point in my life that I always think about what if, is actually the choice I made about where I wanted to go to college. Because I, I decided to go to college at Columbia and I feel like that has led to so many friendships and experiences and internships, which led to jobs. And I always wonder if I had chosen a different school, if I would have ended up in publishing at all. Like that choice to me, I think was, was the one that I could write the nine lives of Jill Santacolo. It's funny you say that. One of the things I've thought about forever is so like my choice to go to Georgetown was really, um, I feel like that was so life-changing and I almost didn't do it. I was going to go to Boston College because I was really afraid to go to college far away from home. And Georgetown was like eight hours away and Boston College was like an hour. And so I was, even though Georgetown had been my dream school, I couldn't believe I got in. And then when I got in, my dad said, my mom didn't even want me to go visit because she thought it was too far. But my dad was like, nope, come on, we'll take the train. And, and so my dad thought, oh, she'll see how far away it is. And I did. And so the plan was to teach me not to go there you know, because right. it's so far away. But then my dad loved it and I really loved it, but I still thought I couldn't go, I couldn't go. But then on the tra train home, I met this guy and it wasn't, I didn't want to date him, but I did, I met this guy. He was like sitting across from me on the train and we talked the entire way home. And randomly he was the son of the guy from, um, oh my God, the Michael J. Fox show, uh, it was when we were kids. Oh my God, uh, fam family, family ties? Is that what it was? Family ties. So the, the father on family ties, it's family ties, right? I'm blanking. Um, the father on family ties, it was his son. His name was Teo. I always mean to look him up. But anyway, like we got into this amazing conversation and we talked for like seven and a half hours. And I remember it was because I met him on a train randomly. I walked off the train and I thought, okay, Donna Freitas, if you can meet a total stranger and have such a great conversation, you know, for seven and a half hours on the way home, you're gonna be okay. Like you're gonna meet people when, if you go to Georgetown and he's the reason I, I went there. Wow, you totally have to look him up. I know, I keep meeting so like he pops into my head sometimes but I feel like, oh, he totally changed my life. In a that's good incredible. Way. I feel like I owe a lot to Georgetown but that is such a big, that's such a big choice in life. Yeah, I feel like it is. So. Um, so why don't I do my last question, which is um, basically throwing things back to you. So we have talked about so many things, love and loss in your books, in your life, in my life too, oh well. 
And I would like to know, is there anything we haven't talked about with regard to any of your novels, with regard to everything after, like specifically, that you feel like, I want people to know this thing that we haven't talked about yet. Here it is. The thing that we haven't talked about that I want people to know about is actually your book. So can you take this last few minutes? And I know we've like talked a little bit about it in different questions, but can you tell everybody about The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano and when it's coming out and how they can pre-order it? You can pre-order it, by the way. That is really nice of you, <laughs> Jill. Um, <laughs> My, so my book, The Nine Lives of Rose Napolitano, which is my first, uh, my debut novel for adults, it's coming out on April 6th. It's about a woman who doesn't want children and um, her husband uh, changes his mind. And so her life has come to rest on, or her marriage has come to rest on whether or not she will change her mind and have kids. And the book follows nine different versions of her life and some she has children and some she doesn't all sorts of different things happen because of that decision. And I would say the, the book is really about choices and about women having choices. It's not really a book about not having kids. It's a book about um, the ways in which uh, all kinds of different themes, I guess, in women's lives and, and motherhood in, in general, I think. And so, so anyway, um, I'm excited that it's coming out and, and you and I are gonna be talking about it in a few weeks together in one of my events. and. Um, it's totally beautiful and it's wonderfully written and it's really thought provoking. And um, I think everyone should pre-order it. Well, well, thank you. And I think that everybody should order everything after if they haven't already. And um, it's such a wonderful read. There's so many different incredible things that Jill brings to life in this book with her characters. Um, many of which we have talked about tonight. And so it is not to be missed. So thank you guys all for coming. And thank you, Jill, for, for letting me be in conversation with you tonight. It's been so much fun. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. And thank you to everybody in the squares for coming. It's, it's so nice to see the little video faces that are on and um, also the names of the people who are not in little video faces. <laughs> thank you all. Have a great night.